uh, the one thing i've learned is don't let the sensations and the doubts and the questions that come in your mind after your first steps into anything determine whether you're going to be achieve any modicum of success in it right mm. after a significant period of time if there are still doubts and things like that then look to answer them the duration of the effort being so short means that the intensity is so much higher mm. and it requires you to be on from the second you put down that for in fact it requires you to be on as soon as the the clock counts down from 5 mm. you need to be ready to commit for the next 4 minutes 55 seconds there's right. no time to think about anything there's no time to negotiate with yourself whether you're willing to suffer or not that's the other thing i learned there's a yeah. hundred ways to win a time trial or achieve yeah. peak performance in a time trial right. there is no one way yeah. you know yeah. uh the way that wiggins does it is different from the way that jerent does it is mm. different from the way primos does it yeah. right yeah. but they all can yeah. win yeah. phenomenal tts yeah. i am bikey winky and this is the working athlete podcast Here I talk to working athletes from all walks of life and experts from various fields to provide you with inspiration, training tips, time management and lifestyle advice. Today's guest is a no stranger to any of us. In fact, he was one of the guests earlier. He's a multiple time national champion and he recently successfully defended his individual time trial gold at the nationals. but for the first time ever he took part in track nationals where he competed in 4 km individual pursuit arguably one of the toughest disciplines in track cycling this is an excellent testament to his constant hunger for learning and his growth mindset how many of you know someone who will put himself in a position of feeling like a total newbie after being a champion for so long i know one of them and his name is navin john welcome to the working athlete podcast again anje good to be back good to be back feels like yesterday i was here yes <laughs> so i'm i'm jumping right right in yeah because um, i'm really really curious to uh, as to what prompted you to um, put yourself in a position where you are a total newbie yeah. right you started at nationals yeah. back in 2012 correct and say 9 years yeah of being um, uh, seven times champion yeah six the, times yeah six times uh, in those nine times yeah you won the uh, national championships yeah. and from being in that position what prompted you to put yourself in a position of a total newbie yeah. that is going and taking part in individual pursuit yeah. on track yeah. so i think uh, with most things um, in life i think the ideas for certain things you know perhaps uh the seed is planted at a certain time and it takes time for that seed to kind of uh you know it takes time to you know you got to water it the soil's got to the temperature's got to be right and it takes a couple a couple of seasons for uh that seed to you know uh, sprout into a seedling and you know uh, sprout and you know grow into a little plant and then you know eventually grow, grow into a tree you know and and eventually bear fruit and so much like um, you know my goal of na- winning nationals and being at the top of my sport in that in that in the time trial and things like that <clears throat> that's an idea that probably you know seeded well before i was here and actually took root in 2012 and then finally bore fruit in 2014 and then i kept plucking the fruit of that tree for the next you know 5 uh, 6 years uh, the same thing with track it's something that has been brewing for a for a long time i think um i use my instagram as a little record it's a record so i use instagram as a record of my journey in the sport you know whenever something important happens whenever something that really affects my thinking or my 
or um, you know a certain seed is planted i try to capture that you know and that's the way i use my my instagram and if you look back on my instagram you'll see that kind of every 6 to 9 months is a post that i've put about track about track racing you know nice. uh whether it's uh, the time i spent in belgium on the track in australia the couple visits i made there um visits to the velodrome uh in india and so this is an idea that kind of kind of board, uh, kind of the seed was planted back in 2016 but it's taken me you know over the years uh to kind of bring everything together to actually be able to you know uh for the seed to take root uh, that's things like sorting out equipment you know uh buying a uh, getting a track bike not having to you know uh, uh blow a ton of resources on it right so get a cheap track bike that's enough for me to perform um and uh also have enough maturity and knowledge about training to be able to combine um you know two disciplines of cycling in a way that the performance of one does not suffer uh in the quest to uh learn something new right? right um so that was also important so it required a maturity about uh, no and maturity and knowledge about myself in training and then also you know um there is this idea that you know you can pretty much master anything if you are persistent enough um over a period of time but you know time is not something that uh, is a uh, i have a lot of as a as a as a top level athlete and so that's where you know the importance of a coach comes in and so uh figuring out who this right person is that i that i've got to reach out to who can help guide me towards this goal and short circuit right my time taken to uh, reach a level of proficiency in this discipline because i can't afford to spend 8 years figuring this out right, right. and uh, the knowledge is out there but it's about connecting with the right person you know a person who has perhaps a similar mindset a, a perhaps a similar approach to the way um you know uh, the similar constraints that i perhaps have right mm-hmm. so it's it's it took all of these years to bring all of those things together mm-hmm. and uh over lockdown <clears throat> i mean the day lockdown was announced i was very clear in my head that when i come out of this i want to since there's no competition for the first time in my life i could actually experiment you know with just riding insane distances you know for my for my capacity and and lift um you know uh get on a lifting program that's just something i haven't put my body through without having to be fresh for a race mm-hmm. uh and even take the risk of you know taking a month off and spending uh, you know moving to a different city and uh living outside of the comfort of my home and you know uh, having no friends around and just mentally focusing on uh living life on a velodrome for mm. 40 days right mm-hmm. and which i also got the chance to do mm. and so yeah i looked at it as an opportunity if not now then when and uh and really at the end of the day the result was i had no idea what i could do in this yeah, discipline yeah, right yeah. all i knew was i am you know i have a good i have a good aerobic pace uh i'm working with a world class coach i'm going to do the work as best as i can i need to stay healthy you know because picking up an injury or or, or getting sick with covid is not going to aid the the cause towards you know getting to that um, that start line as soon as possible and uh, so it 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 was with no idea of any time people asked me people kept telling me you know you're going to be really good at this and you're going to be able to do a sub i don't know you're going to be able to break national records and i was just like okay you know let's put all that aside that's great thank you for your optimism but you know i'm just approaching this uh, from a first principles way i'm just going to take it day by day and uh, you know show up to the start line and, yeah. and try and get a good effort yeah so <clears throat> you gave a gist of uh, you know what, what kind of got you into that yeah but you mentioned uh, you know the seeds were planted sit back in 2017 16 17 16, 17 yeah. when you visited uh, australia yeah. australia yeah so what what uh, what was that uh, so thing? um uh, yeah i mean to be honest um when i went to melbourne i think on my first week there um you know australia has this uh 
has a brilliant track program. And, I, and back in 2015, I'd actually read this book by Chris Hoy, uh, uh, Heroes, Villains, and Velodromes. And that book really changed my uh, mindset, you know, about, uh, about what it means to be an elite athlete. And it's not this red carpet, you know, uh, it's not a magic carpet ride from your uh, from your from where you are to your aspirations, right? And your aspirations sometimes are not the limits of what you can achieve, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so reading that book really changed my mindset. And I read it. I read it when I was in Belgium. Actually, I bought it from a thrift store for a euro, and I read that book, and it really opened my mind. Then in 2016, I went to Australia. So uh, that book kind of put the idea of the importance of track cycling. Um, and how it changed British cycling, right? And how it changed the trajectory of the sport there. And uh, then I started, uh, you know, reading and following track cycling a lot uh, after that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what, what I, uh, what I learned is that, you know, the Aussies, the Brits, um, you know, have this, uh, have this focus on the track program, which is part of their high performance um, kind of Olympic kind of program, right? It's such an important part of everything that they, everything that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I knew Australia had a rich culture of it. And I was like, uh, whenever a place has a rich culture, um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to understand why that culture took hold and perhaps, you know, learn from it. And, and typically it's the behind culture is typically uh, the actions consistent actions of a, you know, bunch of people, you know? Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's the people who uh, run the track clinics at the velodrome, you know, these, these unsung heroes, mm-hmm. right. That, mm-hmm. that form the basis for a lot of, um, you know, <clears throat> um, a lot of big goals that are, you know, uh, that we see on television and that are captured. So uh, when I went to Australia, um, my first experience on the velodrome there was with a, uh, was with a guy named uh, uh, Paul Parker, who ran the uh, disc uh, velodrome in Melbourne. He was a facilities manager there. And he's the guy who taught me, uh, he let me borrow his bike and he taught me how to ride on the track. And he taught me, I, I had no idea. I'd never ridden a fixed gear before. I had never ridden on a velodrome before. And, and this guy taught me how to r- go from zero to riding on a velodrome in about 30 minutes. Right. Wow. Um, you know, and it was, it was beautiful. And I was, and at that point I was like, okay, if this is how much I can improve in 30 minutes, um, this is not impossible. Right. Yeah, right. Third, and uh, the one thing I've learned is don't let the sensations And the doubts and the questions that come in your mind after your first steps into anything determine whether you're going to be achieve any modicum of success in it. Right. Mm. After a significant period of time, if there are still doubts and things like that, then look to answer them. But um, yeah, I I came away uh, from that experience with a lot of optimism, right. Mm. For this isn't something that's so alien, right? Mm-hmm. It's still riding a bicycle to a large extent. Right. And so, yeah, that, that experience kind of, you know, gave me the confidence that if I spend some time on this, um, <clears throat> it's not something that's outside of my ability. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you, in 2017, I think you went to UCI. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, true. Yeah. So 2017, when we went to Belgium, I... I made it this little side project of mine to, uh, we had a friend uh, in uh, in Eigler at that point, Brian Cookson was the president and there was this big push to internationalize um, the UCI's, um, uh, just the offices and the, and the, and the people who worked at the, at the, um, at, in, in Eigler in Switzerland. And that's changed since uh, La Perra has come into, you know, uh, the position again, it's become very Eurocentric again, but with Cookson at the helm, there was a huge push to hire people from, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of diverse backgrounds. So mm-hmm. a friend of mine, uh, Dan from Singapore, um, and he kind of, you know, uh, I was introduced to him and he invited us to the, uh, to the center in Eigler. We booked some tickets there and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we met some resistance, uh, but I won't go to that story. But uh, long story short, yeah, that was another amazing experience, an eye-opening experience to see what a world-class facility looks like, and and to see the um, uh, the Sufferfest guys were actually 
uh, with Neil uh, Neil Henderson, Neil Henderson mm-hmm. and uh, McQuillan mm-hmm. uh, were there actually doing a Sufferfest training camp for masters. Oh. Um, and so it's cool to see that you know there's this there's this brilliant ecosystem and people are leveraging it. And there were also kids from the World Cycling Center there doing their workouts on the track. And so um, yeah, I mean the, the UCI World Cycling Center in Eigler is just uh, an inspirational facility. You know, it's like mm-hmm. world class and um, yeah, that that every kind of I kept revisiting uh, tracks every year, mm-hmm. once or twice in a year, just to keep uh, being inspired. You know, because mm-hmm. you got to fuel that uh, right. the, those aspirations, right? right? Every now and then, while while you're figuring out all the rest of it and moving the pieces of the puzzle in place, it's important to remind yourself why. Uh, and to excite yourself a little bit. And so, yeah, every year there's some, you look at my Instagram, there's some, you know, post about, uh, you know, a visit to the track and hints of my aspirations and things like that, you know, so, yeah. So did you also Mm -hmm. visit uh, our track i think uh, delhi has yeah so the facility. yeah so the delhi track was uh, when i was at the asian cha- uh, championships camp all the way back in 2013 i was actually lived for a month at the delhi velodrome mm. and so but i i uh, i had one opportunity to ride the track then and uh, it was i rode uh, sridhar savanur's bike a former right. road national champion yeah. and it just you know and uh, in 2013 to be honest it's so crazy but the it, it it's it's a reminder that the people that we meet are so important to uh what we decide to do what they say how they behave uh the words that they put forth you know because in that 2013 experience where i rode Sridhar's bike uh there wasn't this person who was there to show me uh you know that this isn't a hard thing to do, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, everyone was like, oh, be careful, be this, be cautious, you know, this, that. Um, but the experience that I had in Australia with Paul was the diametric opposite. Of course, I'd also come there with the intent of learning how to kind of master it. That's right. also there. Yeah. Are you ready? And Are you coming in with the mindset of, I'm going to give this a go. It's not, I'm not going to be great at it. Right. right? But I'm willing to give it a go. Yeah. Uh, so that 2013 experience where I'd ridden and a couple of my peers were around me and um, was a terrible experience. Yeah. You know, I left not thinking about the track again for a long time till yeah. 2015. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, brilliant facility. And, you know, it's, it's nice that we have an Indo velodrome mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's where all our world champions are produced right yeah, at the yeah, moment. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And see that I think is quite a tall dude compared. To yeah, the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's the wrong size, probably. <laughs> probably the, it's the wrong bike size ride. bike, and yeah, it was uh, absolutely terrible experience. Right. So yeah. you, uh, the seeds were kind of planted there, and you had these experiences where you tried, you kind of visited these uh, meccas of track cycling, and kind of got that. Uh, you know, gestation of those seeds going. True, yeah. And what? when did you kind of start putting the solid the steps work. to... Yeah. Uh, so going? 2018, when I went back to Belgium, um, uh, when I was uh, running the Chiclo team and uh that's when uh, ridley was our bike sponsor and through ashish uh, our team owner um uh, an introduction was made and you know um we managed to get a track bike uh from Rid- from the ridley factory mm-hmm. and wow another and another person i met in belgium um uh the international uh, markets developer for bioracer mm-hmm. um a uh, guy named Quinton, uh, he picked up the bike from the factory and brought it over to me. And so, yeah, that, that's when I first put the first piece of equipment in my hand, right? right? And then I visited the velodrome in Ghent, uh, met some great people there, asked about, uh, you know, what the cost of uh, using the facilities were. And so every year there was something that was piece of So 2018 was when I figured out the bike, the equipment, which is a huge part of it, part. which I fortunately paid nothing for, uh, you know, 20, 25 K for a bike that was about 75. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and then during lockdown, you know, I didn't have a pair of clip or uh, TT bars. So found the cheapest pair of TT bars that were UCI legal and got that in through, uh, in lock in the middle of lockdown somehow. And that was it. I had everything I needed to give mm. this a go. Right. Mm. And so, 
uh, I'll be getting a track power meter in the next couple in the week or in the next week or so. So that's one more piece of equipment that's super important. Um, and yeah, there's there's a hundred things that you can spend. I mean, literally, I spend about. 40k on this equipment right mm -hmm. and uh, i could have gone the other way and and blown a bunch of uh, you know money and resources in this but i realized you know what let's see what we can do with the most basic stuff that works really well right, right? right. Uh, uci legal position time in the position and you know structured training and so once i got all the equipment together i was like okay now there's no excuses to give this a go, right? right? Uh, before I could say, oh, I didn't have clip-on bars or, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And um, it doesn't have to be, you know, the top-end bars and this and that. And mm -hmm. and uh, I constantly get messages from athletes uh, asking me if this bike is enough and these bars are enough. And, you know, there's like, you can spend a thousand, a thousand euros on, on, on extensions, right? Yes. But you can spend 75 euros and still be competitive, right? right? Um, and so once the equipment was all together, the big decision was now I need somebody to guide me on this journey. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I follow very few people on Instagram because it can, I mean, social media can get very noisy and it's super important that you are conscious about what you let in. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, because of that, there's about 25 people that I, I mean, that I remain connected with people who have really helped me on my journey mm -hmm. and a couple of people who kind of inspire me, not because of their in, um, amazing physical ability or mental capacities, but because of the way they go about doing things, right. the method, mm -hmm. the process. And so one of the people I follow it was Ashton Lambie, right? Mm -hmm. I followed him after he broke the the pursuit world record in 2018, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, in Aguas Caliente at, at altitude. And uh, the individual pursuit world record was at 411 set by Broadman in uh, 90, 96. And then Jack Bobridge broke it in 2011, um, the year before the Olympics, brought it down to 410, mm. right? And Broadman set it in the Superman position and Bobridge broke it in the UCI legal position. Mm. And then since 2011 till 2018, mm. for about nine years, that hadn't been brought down. It hadn't budged, you yeah. know? Yeah. And this is the years that guys like Wiggins and, you know, legends were competing in the sport. But yeah. a guy with a mustache... Uh, less than six feet tall from Kansas, it took him to bring that record down, right? right? So he's a guy that's so, he was never talent identified by any Olympic development program. He never raced bikes. Uh, so the fact that he was this guy that was so completely out of this, outside of the system mm -hmm. and, you know, um, just has this blue collar work ethic, right? And, um, and he was able to do it. You know, he was the guy that brought it down, not right. an Olympic development program from Australia or uh, the UK yeah. or America, right? Yeah. It was this lone range, right? Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, after he did that, I, I think uh, he kind of um, opened the floodgates to the times we're seeing now, both in the individual and the team pursuit and, and, um, and also in phenomenons like uh, who bought who bought bike, you know the the private team in the UK who's really kind of who really kind of changed the way that um, you know people were approaching these uh, timed events, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, you know what, I I can't think of anyone better right. to to coach, right? right? But at this point, Ashton wasn't coaching. But mm -hmm. one night, um, it was in December. Uh, he put out a post saying, you know, he just finished his USA cycling certification and he's open to working with athletes. I saw the post, I messaged him um, and he replied within a couple of minutes and, you know, that was it. And I found, I found the guy who I believed, um, you know, would be able to kind of help me take that, uh, that first step towards this being an idea in my head right. to actually Absolutely. riding on the velodrome, right. you know, and within a month in December, is, December 1st is when we started working. Mm -hmm. Our first goal was the 
uh, there was a there was a Nandi time trial, I think, in December. Yeah, yeah. That was our first. After the Nandi. Uh, yes. Correct. Yeah. yeah, it was a big BCH organized. Right, yeah. Right. So we said, okay, that's our first goal. Let's try and uh, break the Nandi KOM. We came to within six seven seconds. Right. Traffic was heavy that day, yes. otherwise, and it was windy. Otherwise, oh, it, it was wind, definitely windy. Super windy. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. it would have gone down. Right. Uh, then our next goal in January was a block that I termed pursuit for dummies okay. you know the, and uh, uh, you know and it was a little bit of um, it was tongue in cheek you know yeah. it's it's a guy who doesn't know anything about the pursuit trying to go from zero the goal for that block was to go from zero to competent mm-hmm. right yeah. be able to ride a velodrome be able to ride consistent lap splits mm-hmm. be able to hold the tt position mm-hmm. um basics mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and um and then we achieved that um you know at the end of that block i did a 5 10 standing start individual pursuit it was my mm-hmm. only individual pursuit i've ever done in my life 5 right. 10 at the end of that block i told ashton i know more is possible i know a 5 is possible if we put because i did it without any aero equipment mm-hmm. i said i can put on some wheels put on a skin suit put on a tt helmet i know i can get to 5 mm-hmm. and i didn't have a great day on that day mm-hmm. um ashton probably didn't believe me he thought i was you know this is the most i'd be able to do yeah. Uh, but yeah how do you know right i mean uh, but i had this gut feeling that i could do more yeah. um uh, then we took a month of February to build into the road nationals, mm. and we had two weeks uh, between road nationals and track nationals. Mm. And uh, I said, "Let's give it a go." Yeah. You know. So <clears throat> um, let's take a pause yeah. there, and we'll go into the details of it. Yeah. But I want to know why individual pursuit. Huh. Yeah. So, uh, I so get- there are like ton of events of on track right a lot of so and everything is completely different from yeah. others yeah like points racing yeah scratch racing <laughs> so uh, much one kilometer time trial yeah. so what made you to pick individual pursuit so uh part of it is because the individual pursuit is the it's one of the gold standards of measurement of uh you know endurance um, uh, uh, potential, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll see oh, that some of the best, you see that some of the best riders on the road uh, in track, uh, you know, in in road in road from the UK and Australia have all come from the track. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the endurance events on the track that actually um, uh, are indi- great indicators of uh, long term. Um, success in the sport. You know, mm-hmm. if you look at Wiggins, uh, individual pursuit, if you look at Cavendish, uh, Madison, uh, it's the endurance events. If you look at uh, Simon Yates, um, or Omnium, you know, uh, any of the big guys you see on the road today, they were all, they all uh, were first identified through uh, endurance track success mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and uh, with sprint it's it's a lot harder to have longevity in sport because sprint events the reason why um, um, uh, the reason why it's hard to transfer sprint success onto the road is because it's such a unique um, you know it's such a unique and, and niche uh, effort mm-hmm. right um, <clears throat> and um, why did I pick the individual pursuit because I knew that if I was one of the best on the road in terms of endurance, it's kind of a reverse, uh, reverse kind of engineering of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, this is the event I'm most likely going to be good at, right? right? And um, yeah, and, 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 um, and so it was a no brainer. I mean, of course, the individual, uh, the, the endurance group events like the Omnium, the scratch race, the elimination, uh, all of those, uh, the points race, all of those would also work well with my physiology. Mm-hmm. But those are group events and it involves a lot of uh, dynamics. Right. First of all, I didn't have the experience of riding with, you know, 50 other riders on fixed gear yeah. on, a, on, a, on a banked velodrome. Yeah. Uh, but also I'd be an incredibly marked rider. You yeah. know, and it, it's the same thing in, in the bunch races on the road. Uh, he, ultimately, I'm not Superman, right? And <laughs> I can't ride away from a guy who's only 5% less aerobically stronger than me, yeah. right? So, um, yeah, the, the timed events are the most uh, 
con- uh, uh, is the event where I have the most control over those variables. And so, uh, and it's also, if you're uh, a, a good indiv- if you pursue well individually, then you become uh, automatic selection for it, any team, you know, mm-hmm. and if you're the best pursuiter in the country, you're like essentially the leader of the endurance uh, side of the, of any track squad. Right? Okay. So, yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. There is you get, you are in control of the effort and the results. Exactly. And stuff. Exactly. Like you took the choice for with the ITT on yeah, the on the road, road yeah. right? So it kind of made sense yeah. uh, for me. And also, I think the <clears throat> the nature of the event, the time it takes, is also a kind of five minute power test right (laughs) it's it is you know i used to think before i actually started uh, that uh, pursuit for dummies block in uh, in january i used to think how hard can it be to pursue right i mean it's 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 uh on a on an outdoor velodrome in india the 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 national record stands at 448 it was brought down uh, 449 it was brought down to 448 at this nationals Mm -hmm. um and i was like how hard can it possibly be to do a four 55 minute effort. And I mean, a week from that effort today, Saturday, I done the pursuit. I'm still recovering from it. You know, it's, it's just, it's such a, the mentality is so different in a time trial. It's almost like it's changed my mindset. You know, I used to think a 40 kilometer time trial is hard. Now, when I go back to time trialing, I'm just ready to smash myself to bits because I know the kind of pain that's in store for me for a pursuit. And I'm like, this time trialing thing is easy, you know? <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to kind of the training that's involved in my next uh, time trial, because I think the pursuit, the track, the the intensity and the duration of the efforts, the duration of the efforts being so short means that the intensity is so much higher mm-hmm. and it requires you to be on from the second you put down that. For, in fact, it requires you to be on as soon as the, the clock counts down from five, hmm. you need to be ready to commit for the next four minutes, 55 seconds. There's right. no time to think about anything. There's no time to negotiate with yourself, whether you're willing to suffer or not. Right. Um, I mean, your lap splits in a four kilometer pursuit on a 333 meter velodrome uh, to set a national record, you need to be doing 23 second laps with nothing to guide you, right? It's all a feeling. Hmm. It's, in that moment, you train for it, of course, right. you know, 23 second laps, which is about just about 50 Ks an hour. Mm-hmm. The first lap is always slow because it's from a standing start. Got so it. you're starting with this massive gear. Mm-hmm. You're taking about 12 seconds, uh, basically half of the lap to get up to that 50 kph. And mm-hmm. then you're holding that 50 kph. Mm-hmm. So there's no negotiation for, oh, can I soft pedal here for a second? A pedal stroke backed off means that split goes from a 23.5 to a 23.9. Yeah. Um, two pedal strokes if you back off it crosses in the 24s and all of a sudden you're not breaking national records anymore right yeah. so uh, and to do this you have no uh, numbers to give you feedback you have a coach on the side telling you uh, suppose you did a 23 5 7 9 they tell you the number on either side of the decimal point point so three five mm. right if you're doing a three a 23 six seven nine it's three six mm. you have literally 0.1 of a second right in terms of uh, uh room to play with mm. right mm. and the way you know whether you're going hard enough or not is you ask yourself am i going the more the hardest i can go at this moment in time without dying that's right. it <laughs> you know without crashing uh without uh losing focus of the aero position because as soon as you pop your head up you're going from a 235 to a 24 right just moving your head up right or just moving relaxing your shoulders it's yeah, it's something else it's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah so no uh, yeah what kind of interested me like struck me like a bolt yeah. was that you you said you uh, dread that five minute effort more than the 50 odd minute effort any that day, you are doing now. any day it's reek i mean track and and i see the reason why you know talent is identified on the track because the mental toughness and the mental it requires a level of confidence, which on the road, you don't need this much confidence, you know, right. uh, at least for time trialing, right? You, 
<clears throat> you can, there's so much time to negotiate, you know, you can, I mean, this year in my TT 50, 52 minutes, whatever and a half, I was spending a minute negotiating with the referees about which lane I was going to be on, right? <laughs> that you can't do in a pursuit, right? So it just goes to show that that uh, if you can do a four K, if you can do a four K pursuit, um, you know, sub five, four uh, fifties on an outdoor track. I mean, that's what uh, you know. A guy like uh, yeah, Phil Gaiman did a four fifty on on a on an outdoor velodrome, right? right. So that's the level, right? right. Um, and yeah, it's it's there's there's no hiding from this effort. It's it's something else. Yeah, <laughs> man, man. Yeah. So, uh, how how is the training different from yeah uh, the training for IDT or yeah. the road? Say yeah. you you said uh, uh, you did a block or pursuit for dummies. Yeah. So yeah. How 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 was it? It different? was apples. To uh, it was apples to chicken tikka. You know? <laughs> Normally, it's apples to oranges, right? It was so different, you know. One is a fruit a dessert, healthy for you. The other is like, you know, <laughs> the opposite, right? Uh, I was until I got into until I started working with Ashton. Um, uh, I mean, I could talk a lot about uh, the the paradigm that Ashton has introduced me to. Of course, this is like you know, the second or third fastest individual pursuiter in the world, mm. right? Ghana mm. being the fastest at the moment. Right. Um, Ashton is second, you know, right. on his best day, he's the second fastest guy. Yeah. Uh, another thing to note is Ghana is a, is a power horse, right? right. He's doing 600 oh, watts, geez. you know, for, you know, plus for five minutes, right? right. Ashton's not uh, Ghana, right? Ashton is, he's probably got one of the lowest CDAs, <clears throat> you know, um, of any pursuiter out there, mm. right? Despite the mustache. Uh, despite the mustache, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It, debatable if that adds or takes away. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, his training paradigm is very different, right? Mm -hmm. He's not that aerobic monster that Ghana is, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for him, you know, he's had to maximize every aspect of his fitness, including the anaerobic, you know, and 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 so the way that he has come through the sport. So if I were to follow the training paradigm of a Ghana. I don't think I would uh, be able to do a 455, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not a genetic freak, freak. right? <laughs> yeah. I'm genetically above the average. That's right. it, right? And then I train a lot, yeah. right? Uh, that's my edge. So, mm -hmm. um, so Ashton's paradigm where it involves a lot of off the bike strength work, you know? Mm -hmm. So in the pursuit for dummies block, the largest week I had was 12 hours, okay. right? And the only reason it was 12 is because I asked Ashton to put in one four hour ride because I didn't want to lose my road fitness, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So it's the worst idea to do endurance training alongside, um, you know, pursuit training because it's actually an antagonistic stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. um, it makes you slow. Okay. Right. Road training makes you slow. Right. So ideally it would have been about 12 hours, mm. but you're still feeling like you did a 30 hour week, you know, oh, in those 10 okay. hours. Yeah. Um, so the training involved for me, because you have to go from a standing start to 50 kph in the lowest time possible. Mm. I have a pretty slow start. Uh, I do a 29, 28 at nationals. I did a 27 second uh, first, lap, first lap. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Uh, that's four seconds. Yeah, four seconds over, over the, the yeah, exactly over the normal, right? That's four, three and a half seconds. There. That's the medal there, exactly. Wow. And also, uh, in my particular start, I actually there's a little video where I I start and I actually move down the track a little bit. Uh, so standing technique is super important. Right. It's straight, right? right? Um, so the start is super important. The other thing is when you're aerobically at your potential, right? Mm -hmm. My five minute power is, you know, the best I've recorded is around 415, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is not a huge number, probably one of the best in the country, but um, we needed to get that up, simple as that. And you can't raise your power at VO2 max by doing sweet spot and threshold. No. That stuff just slows you down, right. right? If you can imagine saying that threshold work slows you down, right? <laughs> My God, yeah. The only thing that lifts up your uh, power at VO2 max is bringing up your entire uh, level up, right. right? So that means improving your neuromuscular. So mm -hmm. a lot of sprint, it involved a lot of sprinting, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of gym work, mm -hmm. right? To increase that, that power. Mm -hmm. And then it involved a lot of anaerobic development. Mm -hmm. So a lot of 
30 second just max efforts right where at the end of it you're just like barely hold barely can open your eyes mm-hmm. you know so that anaerobic work was required and then vo2 work so mm-hmm. vo2 work is considered the sweet spot work of pursuit training right Aww. if you can imagine <laughs> four minute efforts with four minute recoveries or five minute efforts with five minute recoveries that's the sweet spot of pursuit training right, right. um and then you'll maybe throw in one you know threshold 10 minute uh, threshold effort or something like that that's the most endurance thing that pursuiters will do right? right the rest of it is just coming in with a big block of endurance mm-hmm. you know before you actually get into Correct. a right. block of specific training right so yeah so they um so you did you do like a two or three sessions of such intensities above uh, yeah so above pretty you? much all the sessions mm-hmm. were in intensity sessions right it was and and this again goes to kind of the paradigm that Ashton works with right mm-hmm. it's like it would involve say gym mm-hmm. followed by sprinting mm-hmm. uh followed by vo2 work the next mm-hmm. day followed by a uh, little bit of a backing off maybe some 10 minute threshold efforts mm-hmm. at high threshold mm-hmm. then gym the mm-hmm. next day and then back to some anaerobic starts uh you know two three minute efforts simulating the first part of the the first part so there's there's um uh this this there's, there's a concept called extensive pacing which is the pace that you hold when you are uh in the middle of a tt and then there's an intensive pacing which is higher than the pace that you will hold in a tt so right. you work both ends of it just like it's like hitting a punching bag from both sides you know <laughs> in the end you end up like a pulp <laughs> but uh it's in while you're doing the training there's no there's no moment where you're like uh this is fun you know it's just really really in tt training there are moments where you're like you you can enjoy the speed once or twice in a week right. uh, with a mock tt or maybe some you know some temp uh, some threshold efforts yeah. but in this it's like you're just being punched from both sides and you're just waiting for competition day to come because that's the one day you will actually feel fast you know right. and it changed the biggest change that i experienced was uh in my in my mindset was um before this i used to look at weight training as something that was supposed to like dent you in the sense make you tired and really tear you down mm. it, uh, working with ashton has changed that uh, has changed weight training into something that actually activates you know oh. so doing a deadlift the day before doing uh you know standing starts you actually feel better for it right oh. uh and um and of course that for a beginner that's not the case but once you once you develop you, that yeah once you, you develop that capacity, base. yeah once you have the base and also base of work in the gym and things like that like in the pursuit for dummies block the day before i did my mock individual pursuit effort mm. i felt like absolute crap because i lifted mm. uh, deadlifted and you know it was supposed to be an activation mm. but the next day i suffered you know mm-hmm. or two days later i suffered mm. but this time you know i felt i felt great still we need to figure out what works and what doesn't work and we need to tweak a couple things because i did a 3k simulation ip the day before the individual pursuit mm. and actually went faster than i did on race day okay. you know okay. so there's something to tweak there also so there's always things you need to play around with mm. and and tweak a little bit because mm. ultimately <clears throat> to get into the like the 445s and things like that mm-hmm. on an outdoor right. you need to be at your best right. you can't be at your best two days before no. you know uh, so yeah man so <clears throat> the, the, the small thing with the weight the yeah. training uh, the difference between yeah. uh, before and now yeah. so that it you use that as activation yeah. now yeah. Ram, rather than uh, break yourself so that yeah. you, you can't do anything the next day, next yeah. day. so uh, is it like the number of reps or the weight or how so, how, how is it different you know so these reps are pretty much at maximum so mm. i said i did my deadlift pb for the season mm. uh, two days before uh, uh, the well one day before the uh, pb effort that i did in 3k mm. so 3 days before the actual main effort right, right. <clears throat> i mean um i think i've heard ashton say that he does a deadlift effort sometimes before a, like a really heavy deadlift effort right before he does his main effort wow right that's so every athlete's a little different sprinters mm. will do stuff like that sometimes mm. but 
Now, on the pursuit side, a guy like Ghana won't touch the deadlift bar a week before. But this is, again, a different paradigm, right? Mm. We are not supernatural uh, aerobic engines. And mm. so we have to maximize, we have to lift up the whole the, whole uh, the you know basement have to be right. everything everything has to be lifted up and mm-hmm. so we need to stimulate everything right up to the day of of competition right mm-hmm. so um yeah so with the lifting it's it's all about low reps uh, you know we're talking five by fives you know mm-hmm. so strong strong lifts right? right no no hypertrophy no 20 reps no no strength no 15 reps I, I haven't done 15 reps of anything uh, in the last year you know yeah. so it's, yeah it's mostly five reps it's, it's all five five to eight rep range maximum max weights and low reps <clears throat> that's it yeah absolutely yeah okay. and of course that's for this type of performance Trends, right yeah. this is this is uh you know maximizing kind of that 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 uh that strength and that power mm-hmm. right so yeah for getting ready for standing stars exactly exactly yeah wow wow this yeah. is really really fascinating stuff yeah and i want to know more <laughs> but uh, let's get into the actual <clears throat> you know uh you shifted base yeah to hyderabad to yeah prepare for yeah. this yeah. right yeah. that's a massive uh, step yeah uh, so you know that um, the road nationals and these nationals yeah. are going to be close, close yeah. but still you kind of set, yeah. went ahead and said yeah okay let me put all my chips in yeah and then give it a good shot yeah so uh, how it, how did that yeah so the approach was simple it's like being very clear with your coach like communicating well is super important right Right. and I made that my priority as soon as I started with Ashton I was Mm. super proactive Mm. because I've worked with I've worked with coaches before I've worked with some awesome coaches people Mm. who've kind of changed the way I do things and changed the way I train Dan Henchy my first coach Mm. David Heatley my second coach Ashton my third Mm. and uh, the one thing I learned is and I coach myself so I realized the most important thing is sometimes you have to be the most communicative person in the relationship, right? Mm-hmm. And so I took that on myself and Ashton's also super, super uh, uh, responsive to that. And so that really worked really well. It's the key to why we've worked so well over the last four months. And I think uh, we're going to keep working together for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so this track block, I reasoned to, to myself as I had a massive year in training, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, last year I figured out this one month block Mm. that works for me Mm. to go from having a massive base, Mm. right? I can just turn on the switch, Mm. plug in this four week block one month before nationals. And I know that this is one particular workout I do. And if I follow, and if I hit the numbers on that workout, I know I'm going to be as long as some new guy doesn't show up on the scene and does 360 watts for 50 minutes. Uh, and I know there's no one on the scene like that. Um, and if everything goes well on race day, mm. I'm good. Right. That's the most I can do. Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, so that confidence that I've gotten from over the years of making mistakes, right? right. Being second in 2018, winning by half a second in 2014 taking really good notes every year. Right. Finally, I've come to this place where four week block, plug, play, execute, stay healthy, mm. That was a big goal of mine. Mm. Um, don't change anything. Don't change your equipment. Don't change your approach. Uh, don't uh, focus on, you know, wasting time on uh, looking for new sponsors, things that just focus on the work, yeah. right? Um, so that gave me the confidence to make this jump mm. two months before nationals mm. and commit to a track block. Right. I told myself, what is the worst that can happen? my anaerobic capacity goes up, my sprint capacity goes up, my strength goes up, my power at VO2 goes up, right? And I know enough about training and experience in the past that I told myself, don't crash. (laughs) That my only thing was the pursuit for dummies block was go from zero to competent. Mm. And I knew that if these are the worst things that can happen, I'll be in great shape, (laughs) right? right? And I'm in the hands of a world-class coach right right? Ashton doesn't have a lot of time traveling experience on the road Mm -hmm. Um, he'd be phenomenal at it uh, but uh, I don't know why he doesn't do it but um, yeah I told myself what is the worst that can happen I'll become stronger (laughs) so uh, so then the decision to kind of 
uh, drive, leave from here, uh, pack up my house into a car, mm-hmm. uh, rice cooker, yoga mat, kettlebells, mm-hmm. uh, you know, bike work stand, Wahoo trainer, uh, you know, I took everything with me, right? right. And put it into a car, uh, stayed at uh, Maxwell Trevor's place, mm-hmm really close to the velodrome, right. uh, took a one month gym membership close by. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, just, just, uh, live the life of train, uh, work, my coaching work, right. uh, sleep, repeat. Right. right. And, um, yeah. And, and the focus was that I had such a clear focus and halfway during that block, uh, the dates for road nationals were announced. Right. And because till then it was like, it might not happen, might happen, might not happen. And all of a sudden when the dates were announced, it uh, sharpened my focus, you right. know, a little bit on the track, because I was like, anyway, you're doing, if you're doing five minute maximal efforts in the TD position, 50 minute effort in the TD position is going to be easy. Right. right. So that, that all those things gave me confidence mm-hmm. and uh, I wouldn't have been able to take this jump any other year, you mm-hmm. know, and it's, and it's, uh, yeah, everything happens at the right time, I, yeah. I believe. And yeah. as long as you're putting in the work, Correct. uh, so that's what gave me the confidence. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then we came back in February, uh, January 29th and we executed the, <clears throat> so in the roadblock training to nationals, again, Ashton had actually put up a plan, mm-hmm. but then I came in and said, Hey, there are two sessions that are super important to me. Mm -hmm. Can we put it in there? Mm -hmm. Right. And one of this is this session that I do on Nandi on my TT bike as a strengthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to be open to, you have to be not afraid to try new things, I guess. So I suggest this is one thing I need to do. And the other one is uh, practice time trials, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, and the rest really doesn't matter. It's all supplemental, you know, Uh, it's all about identifying the signal and what is the noise. Right. Mm -hmm. So I told Ashton, these are the two sessions that are the most important to me. Can we put it in there? Right. Right. And we put it in there and, you know, then Ashton also suggested, Hey, consider changing this strengthies to a, just a TD cadence, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or, and, and, uh, and do the mock time trial after doing a TTT effort, right. On tired legs. And uh, you know, so there are small changes and you have to be willing as an athlete to trust your coach. Mm -hmm. Like this is a block that's worked. I know it'll work, but then your coach comes in and says, Hey, change this about this session. Let's try that. Mm or do your mock TT session tired mm-hmm. after doing a 60 K TTT effort. Mm-hmm. But I did it. And what I realized was, uh, I think I realized three things. One is say what you believe, mm-hmm. uh, is true, right? Mm-hmm. What you believe is important. Mm-hmm. The second thing is be willing to question those things. Mm-hmm. Right. And the third is if you put in a lot of work, uh, there is room for making small mistakes or doing things imperfectly. Mm. The cost might be, you might be five Watts of what you could do, but the learning, the learnings that you get from it, mm. right. Are, are, uh, immense, right. not just for me as an athlete, because now I know this is possible. Mm. We had a phenomenal TTT, right. right? Um, And it also gives you this data bank of experience to say Mm. there's more than one way to get to a, to a peak performance in a time trial on one day. Right. And that's an invaluable experience for you, not just an, as an athlete, as a coach, as a coach. coach. So there will be uh, down the line, there'll be 10, 20, 30 different athletes and everyone's going to be different physiologically. Everyone's going to have different goals and to be able to chart a course to that with this practical experience of having done it 10 ways, 10 ways to, you know, there's, there's a million, a hundred ways to skin a cat. Right. Right. And that's the other thing I learned. There's a hundred ways to win a time trial or achieve peak performance in a time trial. There is no one way, you know, Uh, the way that Wiggins does it is different from the way that Geraint does it is different from the way Primoz does it. Right. But they all, can yeah, win yeah. phenomenal TTs, yeah. right? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, just <clears throat> curious about this uh, strength is on uh, the TT bike. Yeah. On <laughs> the, yeah. So <clears throat> you uh, strength is in my understanding is like five minute. Low effort, cadence. Low cadence, low cadence work. Uh, so this is a term that my coach David Heatley right, uh, yeah. kind of uh, introduced me to. Yeah. Uh, it's a very Aussie way of uh, terming a workout. Right, you know, right. it's like, 
it's strength on the bike yeah. strength you know <laughs> uh so essentially it's 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 uh it's and i uh, and i pretty much it's my bread and butter workout that i subscribe to a lot of my athletes mm-hmm. only if they are ready for it yeah. right yeah. you need to have a really good a really strong core you need to have bulletproof knees mm-hmm. you need to have a strong lower back mm-hmm. and uh it's not an a workout for an inex- inexperienced rider right. right but essentially it's it's spending time at and the power doesn't matter mm-hmm. with strength ease with low mm-hmm. cadence work the power doesn't matter uh there's again there's different ways to to put it into a plan like mm-hmm. i uh for me it's a it's a key workout um you know i when i start off my three week block i'll do my strengthies i basically uh ah, this it, the way i've done this workout has changed over time mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh but essentially it's a strength endurance workout that kind of mentally toughens you more than anything else okay. you know okay. if you can push that big gear listen to your body it's not driven by power n- numbers mm-hmm. it's about holding the position developing that tuck discipline mm-hmm. uh pushing when you want to get out of the tuck um and just being very smooth while applying the power right, right. but ashton turned that workout for me on its head by mm-hmm. telling me not to do it as a strength mm-hmm. right and that also worked so mm-hmm. that be- begin uh, so makes you have- question yeah that makes you question pa maybe that's not the most effective way to do it right, right. uh maybe doing it behind a moto for 10 minute reps uh, yeah. so it, it goes to show that training is not a science yeah. it's it's an art and yeah. fortunately i'm in a place where now i know what my body needs you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. um so being able to adapt is also super important right. you know and i know what my athletes need mm-hmm. when they tell me hey you know the power is coming down 8 minutes into a 12 minute effort you mm-hmm. know so that means that strength endurance is lacking right, right? right. Well, which means what do we have to do in that case right mm-hmm. to make sure that if you can't hold you know uh, tt power for 12 minute reps how are you going to do it for 50 minutes, minutes right yeah. so it's 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 a dynamic uh, problem and you have to be able to adapt and provide the solution for the for the athlete right, right. right. yeah right. so you uh, ended up doing a say your tt cadence instead of say 50 60 exactly cadence, right? exactly okay. yeah okay, okay. Yeah. that works it works <laughs> <laughs> awesome so you went and uh, so you did this uh, you when, when did you go to hyderabad when? january jan yeah. you went yeah. you december did, december 28th came back yeah. jan 29th yeah. yeah so you did that um, uh, dummies uh, yeah, for, pursuit for dummies pursuit for yeah dummies 40 days, days yeah on the track on the track yeah yeah and you came back yeah <clears throat> did you a tt block yeah here yeah uh, along with the tdd tdd uh, practice. Uh, practice yeah and um, you went there yeah. to uh, execute yeah but we will go th- go there yeah but let's kind of conclude the track uh, yeah. track aspect yeah and say how did you you came back Transition, from the yeah. nationals yeah. and uh, you had two weeks two weeks 11 days 11 So yeah. that was interesting right so i knew that was going to happen we had in, an inkling that track nationals was going to be two weeks after road nationals right. so the approach i had was this i talked to ashton i said hey uh after i came back january 29th i said full focus road nationals because mm-hmm. it's super important when you have a goal to just completely a uh, note a uh, note to prioritize right. what to prioritize yeah. so i'm like no changing equipment uh, you know no changing nothing mm-hmm. boom let's execute the tt block right. let's achieve our goal mm-hmm. right yeah. <clears throat> and let's talk about track nationals uh, the day after, after so i'm put on my training peaks call with ashton post nationals track track right. planning yeah. and that's it i took it off my head put it on training peaks my coach knows i know this is all we're, we're not talking about track from now to nationals yeah. we achieved uh, the goal at track nationals phenomenal ride in the team uh, the team stand trial i felt the strongest i ever have on in the road race mm-hmm. right um that was punctuated by the fact that the 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 other riders didn't weren't as focused during corona and the fact that i was at a superior level mm-hmm. right and um and uh came back and 11 days so in the first pursuit for dummies track block if you look at my training peaks mm. normally there's just workouts right? right but every day i made 
I made it a habit to put down a detailed note of exactly how I felt, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So day one, uh, felt 55 out of 100 in terms of comfort on the track. Day two, 75 out of 100. Day three, 80 out of 100. Day nine, 90 out of 100. Day six, day seven. Day seven, 99 out of 100 in terms of comfort level on the track. So it took me about a week to go from zero to feeling comfortable on the track. Yeah. In fact, I did one of my best uh, flying 4K efforts, a 505. Mm on my seventh day there. Hmm. This is the day. And the day before I had my first slide out on the track, Hmm. right? My first and only crash on the track after which I said, I'm not going above the stairs line, the blue line (laughs) said, stay healthy. Don't do any nonsense, you know, right on the black line. You came here to pursuit. Um, So I made this note day seven, took me seven days to acclimatize. Hmm. Right. So I made that note. And what I told uh, Ashen is in the last block, it took me seven days to go from zero to comfortable. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So one approach would have been go to Hyderabad right after Mm. uh, and spend 11 days there. Mm. Um, But we didn't know the schedule of the events. We didn't know uh, if the track was going to be busy because 800 athletes were going to descend on a track, Mm. a 333 meter patch. So I was like, will we have the ability to spend time on the track? So all these uncertainties, we said, let's uh, uh, take the approach of what was the term I used? I said, minimum effective dose, okay. right? So what is the least amount of tack we need, time we need to spend on the track to go from zero to being able to perform? And we determined that was six days. Okay. And so I said, okay, nationals is on the 29th, six days before I get there, day one acclimatize, day two uh, start the efforts, standing starts, gym, you know, some sort of effort, race day, right? right. And in the week before that, train at home, reset, you know, fix up all my equipment, tighten all the bolts, wrap the bar tape, do things that you can do at home comfortably. Right. Whereas in a new city, finding a bike shop, commuting, uh, riding on the road is impossible in Hyderabad. Hmm. Uh, whereas here at, at home, I know exactly what I need to do. Yeah. So trainer workouts, some intense anaerobic work, because we needed to switch from the aerobic stuff that we do, we were yeah. doing back to the anaerobic. Right. And fortunately, I hadn't lost much. I set my peak one minute power two days after I came back from uh, road nationals. Mm -hmm. So I knew my anaerobic was still there. That was that. It wasn't on the plan, but I wanted to test it out, you know? (laughs) And uh, yeah. And when you see a number that effectively captures your anaerobic uh, uh, capacity at that time, Mm -hmm. that's a big positive sign. If you set a lifetime PB, right. And so then I executed that kind of that anaerobic reawakening of sorts. Mm -hmm. And then we transitioned to track specificity, mm-hmm. race specificity, and then we kind of executed, you know, on race day. Awesome. Yeah. So <clears throat> one, uh, how, how did the race itself, the couple of days before yeah. and the race itself? Yeah, go? incredibly challenging, right? Mm-hmm. But that's, the my, that's what I expected. Right. I told myself, what was the first nationals that I went to India? What did it feel like? It mm. felt like I was in the wrong place. Mm. It felt like I should pack up and go home. Mm. It felt like I was asking myself, what am I doing here? Right. Um, and I had zero uh, confidence in my relative ability. Mm. Right. Mm. I knew what my ability was. Mm. I knew what the competition's ability was. Mm. Not really, actually. Mm. But I, most important thing is I didn't know what my relative ability was. Mm-hmm. I didn't know where I stood with respect to the competition, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because nobody knows. Yeah. After Corona, yeah. even even bigger question mark, right? right? Uh, one interesting anecdote was the day before I did a three kilometer mock effort. Mm-hmm. And uh, everyone was training in the morning when the velodrome was full. I was training in the afternoons when nobody was there, mm-hmm. you know? So... I like this feeling that I get when I do things and I'm the only person there because it gives me this incredible sense of um, uh, just saying that, Hey, you know what? You're doing it right. Right. You know, if no one else is doing this, this is hard. Mm -hmm. Training in the 40 degree heat is hard. Most people want to do, you know, efforts and feel great and stuff. But in my last Hyderabad block, I was always training in the heats Mm -hmm. and in Panvel, it was extremely hot. And I was in my entire build up to nationals and in the intermediate period, I was training in the heat. So Mm -hmm. I was ready for this. Right. So um, we didn't know what the dates for the events were. Uh, When I went there, uh, we had a bike check and uh, interestingly enough, uh, I went in a day early for my bike check because Mm -hmm. I knew I knew, I knew, I knew whenever you're new to a certain uh, sport, discipline, discipline, 
you're starting from the bottom and that's right. true for any walk of life yeah. if i were to move from sport into uh, you know the uh, kind of uh, the corporate world right. you start from the bottom right, right? you start bringing coffee yeah. to to you know to the to the the, the boss right yeah. and i knew that when i showed up on the track there were going to be a couple there were going to be three types of people i met one was the ones that pump up your tires mm-hmm. right like oh man you're going to smash it you're going to break the record ignore them yeah. right smile and say you know do your work right yeah. the second type of people are the ones who are not going to interact with you they're just going to observe mm. they don't know whether to be happy that you're here or uh, you know uh, question yeah. right and then the third type are going to be outwardly what are you doing here stay in your lane right mm. so i met all three types of people and i was mentally ready for that and i knew there was going to be extremes right so i mm. met all three types of people uh but i just stayed neutral ignore mm. the noise yeah, right yeah. and um, so one of the areas i knew i was going to face a challenge was with respect to uh information about events and things like that so mm. the schedule i received very late uh but you know what uh, ashin and i were in touch and uh you know we we were very uh we knew how to adapt to it right, right? uh so we adapted it really well uh second was the day before i went in for the bike check one of the officials uh had an axe to grind with me and okay. so and i knew there would be i knew there would be that and so um even though my bike setup was in the uci regulations um at the end of the day the morphological exemption rule is up to the commissaire wow. i participated at asian championships and the and the the unwritten rule is the morphological exemption is granted in the spirit of the rules mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. there is no measurement for what is a morphological exemption mm-hmm. right uh, they say if you're over 190 cm then you're allowed to take you're allowed to go above the 85 cm reach rule okay. but for the lower end mm. uh, there are no there are no written rules and it's intended so that it's applied in the spirit of the rules right mm-hmm. uh, and the commissaire is the last word on the day but for whatever reason the commissaire decided you know uh it wasn't happening and so i had to move my saddle back 3 cm right which wow. is a huge amount right wow. but i told myself you know what in the back of my head i knew this this was going to happen okay. right so just to uh, get the clarification on yeah. that yeah. so the uh, nose of the saddle to the tip of the handlebars uh, the aero bars no. is what no. we're talking so no so basically there's two rules that you need to uh, stay within uh-huh. right so one is everything is measured from the bottom bracket okay. bottom bracket is the 00 correct x y okay. coordinate okay. right uh-huh. reach is the reach rule is bottom bracket to the tip of the extension needs to be 75 cm okay and the second rule is bottom bracket to tip of saddle needs to be 5 cm right, right? yeah needs to be the saddle needs to be behind the bottom bracket correct. Correct. you are allowed to break one of these rules okay if you if you claim a morphological exemption right, right? um you're either allowed to bring the saddle all the way up to the center of the bottom bracket mm. or you're allowed to hold the saddle at 5 cm behind bottom bracket and take the reach out to 80 cm oh, okay you're allowed okay. to violate one of those rules mm. for a morphological exemption okay. and the morph- so your morphological exemption is you are either is, too long I mean, yeah too you're sh- either too tall, tall um so or you you're short in my yeah. case i have pretty short femurs mm. right um and and in general this rule is granted mm. right mm. Uh, allowing to uh, play with one of these rules is right. granted mm. right uh, but it's not so clearly written in the rules that it will be granted uh, uh, for sure right. Right? right it is determined by right. the commissaire right. on the day oh, right, right. Yeah. and um, yeah so uh, that was something that happened and and uh, and i had to i had to i could i could let that De- dwell in my head mm. uh or i could just go out and do the ride you yeah. know and so yeah. that's what i chose to do i chose to go out and do the ride and mm. and and um uh, yeah that that so as far as the race itself this was the pre race kind of challenges right. but i expected it you know yeah. it's yeah. it's part of uh, yeah. it's part of racing yeah. uh the race itself um a lot to improve on you yeah. know let's just put it that way mm. uh, the list is long mm. um and you know i think the best way to answer that question is to 
perform better than I did. Right. And and so Ashton and me are already talking about addressing all of those things. Mm-hmm. You know, my training peaks is like uh, the notes on that day is like, <laughs> you know, couple, let's say there's about 20, there's about 20, good 20 points there, right? right. Ranging from position, uh, speed in the position, power in the position, mm-hmm. um, uh, what equipment needs to be upgraded from the bike to the TT helmet, to the skin suit, to the shoe covers, to the, uh, to the cockpit, uh, to the mentality that's mm-hmm. required for mm-hmm. this race, mm-hmm. to the, uh, just practicing more, you know, right. simple as that. And, and also, uh, tweaking the actual, uh, buildup, mm-hmm. you know, the actual training plan to, mm-hmm. To, uh, to make sure that this time, next time we perform on race day, not two days before race day, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so yeah, there's a ton to work on. So yeah. Okay. So yeah. one thing that uh, uh, struck me was the, you said the mentality that is needed for yeah. the race. Yeah. So uh, what did you feel that you lacked on that? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, there's something you can't simulate no matter how much practice, of course, practice goes a long way towards addressing it. But Mm. for me, just to share exactly what was in my head, Mm. four minutes, 55 seconds, 12 laps, the Mm. first three to six laps of that race in my head, what was going on was, have you had a concussion before a crash and a concussion? I literally felt like I was concussed. I was asking myself questions like, where am I? keep going hard, keep going hard. What am I doing here? Keep going hard, keep going hard, you know? And uh, so par- it's because uh, whenever you're exposed to a new stimulus, your brain is processing all those things. And this, uh, this, this out- uh, outer body feeling is a manifestation of that right. to a large, yeah. yeah. So essentially the first, you know, uh, 455, 12 laps, the first three to six laps, felt like an out of body experience, you know? Mm. And I was just like, what am I doing here? Is this a race? Is this it? Is there an, uh, hopefully there's another effort. This sucks, you know, uh, hopefully will they give me a second chance? And then by six laps to go, I started recognizing where I was. I started recognizing the importance of this effort. I started recognizing that this is it, yeah. you know? And um, yeah. And it's part of that when you, when you, that that race scenario mm. is something that my mind uh, has experienced for the first time. Mm. The official, the mm. standing start, the the gu- the gun going off, the uh, time splits being shouted at me, mm. um, athletes, uh, the entire stadium going silent, mm. right, mm. observing this effort, but mm. being full at the same time. Right. All of those things. I mean, the lap counter. I never practiced with a lap counter, and then on the track there are these pads which it's really close to the back black line. You should hold the black line, but if you deviate from the black line, you hit these uh, sponge pads, Mm -hmm. which if you hit that, you're not going to go down, but you can lose control of a bike when you're going full gas. So all these things are things that I had never experienced before. And whenever your brain experiences new things, a lot of that computational power has gone into deciphering what is happening, right? right? That's exactly what I felt during this effort. And Mm so the only way to normalize those stimuli is to do more of it, more of it. right? Yeah. Because now when I do nationals road ITTs, mm. I don't notice anything, right. you know, because everything is stuff that I've seen before. This right. year, I noticed the race official, <laughs> but everything else I've seen before, you right. know, I've seen dogs crossing the road. I've seen riders crash in front of me. I've seen, I've passed riders, riders have passed me. I've taken uh, dirt U-turns, you know. Uh, been rained on been everything you know so but on the track it was everything was new and it took me six laps it took me two minutes and you know 35 seconds to just normalize that right Um, and that's that's like 50 percent of the effort effort to kind of try to you know get your orientation exactly exactly and you never know how many seconds exactly i mean you're getting time splits and Mm -hmm. and uh the thing about the pursued effort is the first half is easy the second half is death you know it's just you're basically pushing uh, when everything in your body wants to stop, you right. know, as soon as you reach the three minute mark, the last kilometer and a, the first kilometer and a half is easy. Right. You have to make sure that you don't go too hard. Right. That's the key. Yeah. The last kilometer and a half is absolutely just, you know, brute force. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 
Oh man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pursuit is not something that I'm going to try, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. It definitely ages you, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah. So you this this was like uh, exactly one week back that you did it yeah. and you were saying that you're still recovering. I'm still recovering. Yeah, I mean the 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 rhinitis that you experience because of the fast moving air in your in your nasal passage mm. the uh, the conditions there were really hot and dry air mm. so the the speed at which the air is moving to your throat maximal right you, yeah. it's a max effort right right if if i had a palm meter that would have been my 5 minute pb you know yeah. so uh or 4 minute 55 second pb <laughs> so yeah it's a maximal effort and and i think today is the first day where i feel like the entire week i just felt tired my throat was you know i just just didn't feel right and right. yeah the more a week yeah i mean uh, glad that you recovered enough to come and speak yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah i know <laughs> barely yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh you were um seven seconds slow yes. uh, slower than the, the fastest, fastest time yeah. on the day yeah and is that the new record so that's the new national record on an outdoor velodrome Okay. Right. So okay. 448 7 mm. uh, set by Anil Manglo from the railways. Mm. And then a 0.1 second slower mm. was uh, Dinesh from the services. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's it's on the road, it's seconds, right. uh, minutes in, yeah. in my case. Yeah. On the velodrome, it's 0.1, Point a tenth of a second, right? right? That's the delta. Yeah. And um, and then third was Manjeet, yeah. uh, who was second in the road nationals. Right. Right. And um, and uh, fourth was, uh, I forget who fourth was, fifth was another rider, Poonam Chand, who holds the indoor national record in the velodrome, mm-hmm. uh, 436. Mm-hmm. Um, so these are the best guys, right. you know, these are the best guys. These are the guys who've done probably about 50 individual pursuits. This right. is my second individual pursuit mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's, there's, uh, I hold quite a way. Our fourth was Venkapa mm-hmm. from uh, Karnataka. Okay. So, and a lot of these guys are a lot younger than me. You yeah. Know? So uh, the youngest rider is 20. Mm. Uh, and then 21, 22. Manjeet is 20. Uh, he's about seven years younger than me. So 28. Mm. Uh, so these are guys who are all of a sudden, you know, I feel like the old guy in the room, you know, <laughs> like uh, uh, nine years ago, I was like, you know, yeah. uh, one of the cubs. But um, yeah, people ask me, you know, hey, uh, uh, when do you plan on slowing down or switching yeah. gears? And I'm just like, I don't, I mean, I, at least, I guess part of an athlete's makeup is um, you don't look at uh, age so much as, um, as a factor in mm. performance to a mm. large extent. Right. Um, it, what I've learned is, and as I've aged in the sport mm. over the last nine years in Indian cycling, what I've learned is I'm only getting stronger mm. And what I've also learned is that if you focus on the basics, mm. right, age is the noise right. in athletic performance, okay. right? It isn't the factor that's limiting most of us, right? right? And it's, it's prioritization that's the most important. If, if sport becomes a second priority, mm. that's the day I, I am not the best anymore. Right. And uh, there are a lot of things you can do to make up for aging, mm. you know, uh, lifting up the entire, uh, you know, most of us just say, oh, we just need to do more threshold efforts or more power at threshold. And that's how our threshold is going to go up. Right. You need to focus on the things that you've never touched on, mm-hmm. you know, in, in your previous training blog. So right. strength, pliability, flexibility, tissue maintenance, uh, you know, percussive therapy, uh, you know, SMFR, uh, deep tissue massage, uh, sleeping seven hours a day, eating sensibly, drinking enough water. These are the, these, this is the signal. Yeah. The rest of it is noise, noise. right? Yeah. Uh, societal uh, uh, pressure, peer pressure. Um, that's the noise, right? right? Yeah. Uh, and if you let it get in, mm. then it's going to, then it's a downward, then it's a downward slope, yeah, right? Yeah. Then the doubt. And then the question is, uh, 
is age holding me back stuff yeah. like that right that, that will that will kind of become amplified right it creeps so in, because yeah. everything else you let it in yeah. the noise you let it in you lose Obviously, focus of the signal yeah, yeah exactly lose. so that's it i mean as long as you focus on the things that are uh that that gives you the gains mm. that's that's what's important so yeah yeah so you are still uh, doing your best power ever like you, I mean, you mentioned one minute power you yeah, did best yeah uh, five minute power and yeah and i think every, everything abs- every metric yeah, yeah. how much i'm lifting in the gym um and every other metric on the bike is just going up yeah you know? so yeah so i mean with the age so it doesn't yeah. matter yeah, at least so far <laughs> <laughs> so yeah <laughs> yeah so that that's good yeah so what now for the track yeah so you you experienced your first track yeah. nationals so what yeah. where, where do you see yourself i think going? the approach is so just today right before i came here i did like you know it's my off season so mm-hmm. i'm taking uh 14 days just not touching the bike mm. just because i don't want to touch it mm. I've, i've gotten sick of it yeah. uh, i'm allowing myself to get sick of it you know yeah. so that i can come back even more hungry so mm. april 11th is when i get back on the bike and um yeah, just today i put down just today ashton messaged me and said uh, i put up a video on instagram of my pursuit a little bit and he's like dude we have a lot we can improve in terms of position mm. right and that's a huge sign sign of all. i know that yeah. i know that because i spend 75 euros on my position right, right. and uh, the bikes that were at nationals i mean these these boys are spending you know upwards of a lakh lakh and a half on their their bike setup right mm-hmm. um so i know there are gains to be made there my coach sees it he's mm-hmm. the best in the world at yeah. position yeah. um this was my second pursuit effort mm-hmm. i'm going to do a lot more yeah right so for me uh the goal is and i've outlined some goals you know so <clears throat> track nationals in december road nationals in november or ballpark plus right. or minus one month yeah. right um asian track championships are happening in october mm. yeah in in hyderabad mm. again wow. right so but i'm sixth fastest so i'm mm. not a selection on the team right? right so i need to figure out can i put my hand up for that right mm. maybe the selection trial a month before that so already the year is kind of playing out mm. uh road uh asian championships probably in march of next year right so the outline is starting to take shape a little bit and this uh these this next week is all about putting the, uh, down that outline and then of course mentally kind of filling in uh the gaps of the work that needs to be done so big picture uh, do i need to move to hyderabad when do i need to move uh how does that sit up against my other events things like that uh can i make it to europe this year will borders open up you know maybe in june or july mm-hmm. um is that something i should avoid doing this year because of the risk of maybe being stranded there or you know i uh, think it is a right. big big chance yeah so yeah anything can happen yeah. nobody knows yeah. right and yeah there is a uh you have to be willing to take some risks right. uh because if you're not willing to take risks then you're going to stay at the level that everyone is at yeah, right yeah, so right. i'm thinking about taking risks mm-hmm. you know but measured risks right, right? because right. i don't want to be i don't want to do what everyone else is doing because yeah. then i'm just going to be at the same level yeah, yeah. so um or maybe going to australia right? right so that's the year starting to take shape uh then i have to figure out this is that constant challenge right mm-hmm. i can spend you know 2 and 1/2 lakhs on my equipment or mm. i can spend that on my coaching right mm. because yeah working with the best in the world is not free yeah, right of course. and i value his time and and there is a cost to it right and i and i prioritize good coaching and guidance above you know faster skin suit right, right. um because that you can throw money at and solve mm. the faster skin suit problem good coaching mm. takes months to yeah. kind of build and the yeah. work needed takes months. So yeah. yeah, this year is going to be a lot about rebuilding, kind of reaching out to sponsors um and also maybe reaching outside of the traditional sponsorship model saying hey, this is what I want to do in Indian cycling mm-hmm. and I need a little bit of help to do it mm-hmm. and you know, uh, other people out there who are willing to help. So it's it's everything, you know, from the ground up. It's like right. starting from scratch again, right. you know. So yeah, track ambitions are just to improve on what I've done. Mm-hmm. Uh um and i have not put a number to it we've not put a number to it but right. just do the work and see where we end up on race day yeah. that's it yeah. because yeah. Phew, that's all you can do yeah 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 
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Great. I, I mean, this gave me uh, personally a lot of insight into your track project. Yeah. And, uh, you know, how it originated, how it panned out, yeah. uh, how you prepared and how you executed. And, um, you know, why you kind of uh, you know, put yourself in a position of in being an absolute newbie there. Yeah. Right. So it is really, really uh, commendable uh, that you are, you have the mentality uh, to do that right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, let's take a little step back and uh, quickly summarize the nationals uh, the road nationals yeah how it kind of panned out this year yeah so what um you know i i saw a few photos of you uh, and you, you mentioned that you was had the negotiation time in between <laughs> a minute negotiating with the officials oh, yeah. and then a minute cut down as penalties yeah so what what happened there yeah so i mean uh, there it was basically it was a reminder to me that no matter how many time trials you no matter how much you do something right or how much you think you've mastered something mm -hmm. uh there's always room to be humbled <laughs> you know i mean here i was thought that oh i knew the course you know out and back, <laughs> out and back. you know two lanes out two lanes back but <laughs> Uh, it also it also goes to show that yeah when you operate outside the system sometimes you know you're not in the same room as where the decisions are being made and and that's a price you have to pay I guess you know mm -hmm. but uh, at the end of the day you have to have certain principles mm -hmm. and I've chosen those principles and I've decided to do things a certain way you mm -hmm. know and I'm not going to compromise my perform my performance by attending a meeting that happens at eight the previous night before I'm supposed to peak perform, right? Mm -hmm. I'm willing to risk that, right. you know, and that's what happened to a large extent. Okay. Uh, you know, um, there is nobody. Um, yeah. I mean, and some people don't see getting seven hours of sleep before your main, your, the event that you worked for, uh, for a year as being important. Right. But I realize the importance of it. And the moment you let those things slip is the moment that you should just stop doing something, right? right? right. If you're not doing it right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you and you do, sometimes you end up paying the price for it. You know, <laughs> right. you miss the important uh, announcement saying that we are going to be using all four lanes of the highway and, and going out and back and out and back, right? So it's like a snake. Serpentine, serpentine. like a snakes and ladders, oh, right? Okay. So literally out, back, out, back on all four lanes versus two lanes out, two lanes back. Oh, okay. So yeah. you can imagine there would have been 50% of the times that I had a chance of being right. And right. there was 50% of the chance that I had a chance of being wrong. And, right. and uh, I wasn't the only one on the course who made that uh, mm. error, but uh, uh, yeah, it was made. And then I accepted that that was my mistake because mm. ultimately you need, if you're playing a game, you need to know the rules, right? right? And uh, uh, you can't claim ignorance is, is, is not bliss there's right. a there are repercussions right? right in this case um the price i had to pay was 30 seconds fortunately it was not deemed that i had done three lane violations because uh, then it would have been a minute and a half and i would have been second right, right? and that would have been a tough pill to swallow yeah. uh but yeah i'm glad it was only a minute and i had enough in the tank <laughs> for a five second buffer to you know hold on to first yeah, place yeah. So, so you yeah. basically uh what was docked 60 seconds, 30 seconds for two lane violations okay. was the two. official communique. And, mm -hmm. and I put my case uh, to the commissaires saying mm -hmm. that the intent was not to do yeah. that, to right. violate the rules. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a lack of uh, the communication, right. um, uh, official communication. And also um, uh, no one was put in danger, but at the same time, it could be, you know, right. it could be a very dangerous situation where I was in the long, wrong lane and someone is in the right lane, things yeah. like that. Yeah. 
Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, you have to put forward your case, which I did. And mm-hmm. then I also had to accept the penalty, which yeah, I did. Right, so, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we were uh, waiting here uh, and for, for the first time, we did not have the results. Like, I mean, we were uh, used to getting the results. Yeah. Uh, uh, our social I, media. Yeah. I immediately, I was like, night, it was like, oh, what's happening? Eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I mean, it was the longest six hours of my life just waiting for that. You know, yeah. one of the longest six hours. I've heard yeah. tense, more tense situations. I was uh, messaging Che. I'm sure, like a yeah. hundred others, <laughs> yeah. but uh, like he was like, no idea. I was like, what? That's exactly <laughs> the way it felt. Everyone was waiting for the men's elite results, and uh, everything was coming out a couple hours after the event. But we had to wait till about nine till right. the, uh, till the officials made the official announcement and put out the official results. Right. So yeah. But uh, you know, it was like uh, we, we when the results came out and saw five men, five seconds, we're like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, like that's exactly but how I the think. initial uh, uh, news was like okay and you got something yep. penalized yep. or something yep. he was, might not be on yep. the top oh, and like, trust like, me the rumor mills are oh jeez I was like yeah. I, and I was uh, partaking in the rumor mills, uh, un, uh, you know, unknowingly. Like, and then I, but the, uh, at the end of the day, I realized, oh, you got to hold back. And you, I, I know you this. absolutely have to wait because, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, people were messaging me and people were congratulating me. And I never, after my first nationals where I won by half a second, I never accept congratulations till the men's ITT final results. Completely, PDF is out. Yeah, and even then, yeah. I give give it a cooling period of about 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And then so, I, I say, okay, you yeah. know, I accept congratulations. So I, I just, it's just from experience, you learn, just wait. Yeah. Don't celebrate too early, you know, right, right. Uh, as we learned from Alaphilippe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, that, that went uh, you know, <laughs> just at the end of the day, that, that's about, about yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, but then you um, showed up at the road race. Yeah. The next day, yeah. and a uh, lot of things went on in the road race. Looks like from yeah. the whatever uh, you know race reports and the pictures that I saw. Yeah. How, how did the plan? Out? So yeah, we did the TTT on the second day, mm-hmm. and the plan. Uh, as far as uh, me and my coach had decided we were going to skip the road race this year mm-hmm. and surprise everyone and do the crit. Right. Everyone is like, where is Naveen in the road race? Right. right? And this show up for the crit, right? Yeah. One hour event. It works with all the specific training we've done. Yeah. Um, and, but I woke up the morning of the road race, seven 30 late. Mm. Uh, and Naveen Raj had mentioned that he had heard from Pooja that there might be a possible lockdown in Maharashtra. Right. I was like, oh man, there's a lockdown, then no crit tomorrow, then Gagan's race is going to be cancelled. I'm like, you know what, if there's one thing we've learned from this whole pandemic is, whatever is in front of you, do, take it and do, right? Uh, You never know whether tomorrow everything is going to be locked down. And so I woke Gagan up, he was like rubbing his eyes and like, Gagan, you want to do the road race? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And literally all our bikes, because we had the TGT the previous day, so we warmed up on our road bikes and um everything was like scattered all over the room and i was like naveen you're in charge of bikes anish you're in charge of hydration and nutrition we're doing the road race 100 kilometers <laughs> yeah. when i called che and said hey we're coming to the start line in 30 minutes <laughs> so 30 minutes naveen set up all our bikes you know you had to change the pads from rubber pads to carbon brake pads uh, our derailers were all over the place we changed wheels naveen set up everything in 30 minutes Gagan and I rode to the start. We show up for an 8.30 start and then the road race is delayed by five hours. <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting in the Spectrum mobile. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, big shout out to uh, Doc for letting us borrow the car and yeah. we're sitting in the Spectrum mobile and literally looking through the glass, everyone is sweating bullets and waiting for the race to start. Finally, the race starts, but we had stayed on top of our hydration, our nutrition. Plan was to set up the race uh, for a sprint for Gagan mm-hmm. uh, to uh, he'll, uh, he'll let him kind of get that experience of riding his first elite road race. Yeah. Uh, so essentially that meant closing down the race. That was right. my job. Right. And then the second plan was for Shri. This is something that we've been talking about for a very long time. And yeah. this was Shri's first year in the elite. Yeah. And uh, Shri, put in, Shri had put in the work, yeah. you know, and he has developed this uh, ability to... 
uh, surprise people, you right. know, because nobody uh, marks him as a contender. Right. Uh, to win the Nandi Epic two years in a row in yeah. a break, yeah. not easy. Not right. Easy. Uh, there are only few people who can do it. Yeah. I cannot do it yeah. mainly because everyone knows me, right. right? Everyone knows when NJ goes, get on his wheel. Yeah. Uh, but Shri, but the thing is, everyone's tactic is so clearly in their mind when NJ moves, get on his wheel. Mm. The thing about that tactic is it opens up the race for every other rider who's not NJ, right? right? If only that rider is willing to suffer right. to put themselves in that situation. Like right? last year, uh, it was um, the Delhi boy, right? So in, in, in every year, it's uh, yeah. so last year it was Pune, Pune. right? it absolutely opens a race. It's yeah. an incredibly powerful tactic for everyone else who's not me. Yeah. The clarity of that tactic yeah. makes it an open race for the underdogs yeah. who can, who can, who have the balls, yeah. you know, to swing it. Yeah. Uh, and Srinath has mastered how to swing it. Yeah. He knows when to go. Yeah. Right. Um, and a lot of times when Srinath goes, he goes, Nobody follows. The gap just dangles. Mm. It comes closer and then boom, he mm. goes again, mm. right? He just stays on the power basically. Right. And uh, the one thing that Srinath doesn't have is a phenomenal sprint. He doesn't have a huge five minute power. He doesn't mm. have a large threshold. Mm. But what he has, uh, we've trained over the last 2018 was the year where we really pushed him to change his body. Mm. He can hold uh, the pace of the peloton for a very long time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. uh, there's this one ride that him and I did uh, it was five hours, 160 Ks. He still says that is the hardest ride, ride he's ever done in his life. We averaged about 35 Ks an hour riding through city, this, that. He was just on my wheel the entire time. And that recalibrated his level of what he's capable of. You yeah. know? So you need these, these, these moments that just remind you that is suffering. Yeah, this is this not, is not, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he's had that, you know, yeah. and he's had Belgium and the challenges of that and things like that. So, uh, she was what I told she was, you do what you do, hmm. you know, and uh, I will set up, I will restack the card so that you can do what you do. Hmm. So essentially my job was to close the race. So right. every single thing that went, hmm. if it didn't have a railways and services, hmm. I chased it down. If it had a railways and services, I chased it down. And so that happened for the first 50 K mm. and everyone was dead. Right. There were about 10 guys who were not dead. Mm. Uh, Arvind, me, couple other guys. Um, and Shri kind of 50 Ks to go. Everyone was hoping this was the end of the race, yeah. but the guys who are really in a chance for the win know that this is just the beginning. Yeah, right. Yeah. And Shri sensed that uh, made a move. Um, uh, and when I saw that move go, I was like, that's not going to work if it's by itself, especially because there's no railways and services in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then Arvind also had an athlete of his in that break. Mm -hmm. uh, Vijay Bura was eventually second. Mm -hmm. And so Arvind went up also. And then I was like, I'm not letting Arvind <laughs> go by himself. So I had to follow him. And then the break settled. Um, uh, essentially, what we realized was unless Arvind and I, we have a little bit of that understanding, just like we're just bike racers yeah. and we're like, we're like uh, good guys. Yeah. So we both realize and, and Arvind will do the most work he can yeah. and I will do more than what I can normally. So yeah, I mean, every uphill, every slow section, I kind of, which was where you make a difference on the peloton because right. into the headwinds and the uphills is yeah. where the tough parts is where you open up a gap. Correct. So I made sure I was pulling on those and Arvind took us on the downhills and we kind of held and built up the gap and we knew the race was done. This was the break when the entire, we looked back, there was just one motorcycle. And then like, after the U-turn, like the full, you know, 20, 30 motorcycles were behind us. We're like, okay, this yeah. is the race. So then it was just up to me and Arvind to just hold the gap and, you know, uh, let all the other boys sit on. Mm. Um, and yeah. And then in the sprint, uh, I let it out. And, um, uh, yeah, there, there was a different way to have played that yeah. and we'll have to keep it for another nationals to right. see if, uh, see if we can improve on that. Yeah. But say, seeing, um, uh, Shri there, yeah. it, with the, you know, yeah. at the sharp end of the race, the caliber, yeah. These are the and, best guys. Oh my God. The, you yeah. know, you, uh, Arvind yeah. and some of the best yeah. sprinters yeah. there. Yeah. And this is the first year for yeah. Shri. Yeah. 
in the uh, you know elite category yeah. this is this is a this goes to show this is the part of cycling that you can say that where it goes to show that cycling is a team sport right. you know having the support of a team is super important right. in a road race like this right. Right? right and having teammates who are willing to commit to the plan that was stated yeah. you know, at the start i mean yeah. i've been part of so many teams but um i've never in india there are so few opportunities to race mm-hmm. that everyone races for themselves right. right but for me going forward i've realized that you know if i'm on the podium great mm. uh but if it's an athlete of mine on the podium even better, even better right? right because yeah. um and so my goal going forward for every road nationals is and if it every year the number of ward bombers in the elite field are going to increase right. and uh it's going to change the dynamic of the racing we're going to see more non railways and non services guys this year a services guy won sapir mm. uh but my prediction is that in the future even arvin's got a lot of athletes at yeah, least yeah. coaching who are yeah. stepping up now right. it's going to open up the racing because before you had two dominant teams right. but now you have what bombs elite riders and uh, velo inside coaching riders yeah. who are performing at the top level yeah. and they don't have jobs right. right these are privateers who are just in it for the passion of it and they figure out how to support themselves yeah. some might end up in the railways and services but it brings in a, a whole other dynamic to the racing and what bombs elite riders and velo inside riders are not the type of riders that are going to sit in the field and no. you know they're going to be super aggressive right. they're going to make the racing i mean this this was the most fun i've had in a road race besides my 2017 win right. this was a proper bike race yeah, for yeah, the yeah. first time in a very long time at nationals yeah. so yeah. yeah it is it is super absolutely yeah, yeah. you know heartening to see that yeah, right yeah, that yeah. things changing Absolutely, from yeah. being a defensive uh, racing yep, yep. to to more a foregone conclusion right. to it opens it up yeah, right yeah, yeah. uh yeah and arvind and i talked after this we spent like 2 hours on a on a call and we talked about you know mm-hmm. uh we're excited for right. where this is going yeah, right yeah, i right. mean uh, So yeah let's yeah, see he had a ton of uh, guys uh, on the yeah, the, on the podiums yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah second in the road race um in the time trial neither of us had anyone on the podium uh, with the under 23 time trial is such an open field yeah, yeah. uh you have new guys who you'll never see again yeah, you know yeah. gagan is unique in that sense because he's a repeat mm-hmm. podium getter right, from the under 23 right, right? right. the all the other under 23s you see them the winner of the under 23 time you see them one year on the podium and then they're gone they're gone you know so for right. various reasons yeah. um so yeah. yeah talking of gagan he missed the chance at the itt but kind yeah. of made up at the the funny thing is, is we uh, with gagan we made the time trial such a big focus yeah. all of his preparation is towards the time trial yeah. and it's a conscious decision yeah. you know because we spent zero conscious time talking about the road race right. the thing is gagan is one of the best finishers mm. in the under 23 mm. right uh this is uh, sachin sharma from gujarat uh, and this year's winner surya tatu from maharashtra mm. uh gagan from karnataka these boys are like genuine good finishers right. you know with a really good level of endurance they're mm. really good all round riders they're like a shridhar savanur right, right? Yeah. that's what these guys are yeah. the thing is a lot of these guys won't stick at it for long enough mm-hmm. right uh, gagan's uh, <coughs> physiology makes him a really good bunch uh, finisher mm-hmm. and uh, a really good puncher and uh, uh, he's not a good roller mm-hmm. right his mm-hmm. his his aerobic capacity is nowhere near his uh, Uh, aerobic potential mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. uh his, his his threshold power is very low fraction of his power at vo2 max mm-hmm. right uh 80% right? right so we really have to do a lot of work on that to get him to perform at that level that's required to win in under 23 g which is why we make that the focus mm-hmm. zero training in the road race and he's second <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest the only reason he was second is because surya his surya strategy was to mark gagan. mark him and if yeah. you mark the strongest sprinter in a race in an uphill headwind finish yeah. you're probably going to come around him if yeah. you if you come around him at the right time right, right? right. so uh, but that's a strategy that will only work a couple times mm. and uh, the next couple are going to have to be mano mano and also yeah it's it's going to be interesting there's yeah. some strong guys in the under 23s yeah. Yeah. yeah i'm i'm really excited for uh, the uh, future uh, in in nationals yeah. uh, both road races and itts with the bo- ward bombers yeah. and the velo inside yeah. and yeah. you know a lot of other yeah. new uh, new crop of riders a coming lot, up a lot right? yeah and there, there are other um, 
athletes who are coming out from other states, mm. some privately supported, some part of team structures, right. you know, private team structures. It's no more just guys whose end goal is to get a job. You know, right. these are guys who are just like in it for the passion of the sport, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because cycling is cool now. Yeah. 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 Thank you for uh, taking the time out. Pleasure and, being uh, here. Hopefully we have the recording. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, until next time. Yep. So make sure you subscribe to the Working Athletes podcast on Spotify or YouTube or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. And so you don't miss out on any, any of future episodes. Thank you, Anjay. Welcome. Thank you.